Shortly after the conquest of 1066, once his victory at Hastings had been secured, but before he began harrying the north, William the Conqueror began to gift his most ardent supporters with those lands and titles that had previously belonged to the vanquished. One of the men who benefited from the new king's generosity was a Norman knight named Ralph de Pomeria. Now, before we continue with this story, I want you to put aside any thought of chivalry or shining armour. Knights of this era knew no such codes of conduct and held little in such high regard as ruthless slaughter. However, even in an age where brutality was often hailed as a virtue, Ralph de Pomeria stood out. In the days that followed Hastings, when rebel lords and Saxon warriors often rebelled, Ralph gained a reputation for crucifying King William's enemies on the walls of their own homes. So, in due course, his loyal service was rewarded with the Devon estate we now call Berry Pomeroy and the prettiest daughter of the local Saxon elderman. Over the years, he built a manor house on the grounds where Berry Pomeroy Castle now stands, alongside a tall tower containing a dungeon. Now, I'd like to tell you that Ralph's brutality was nothing more than the product of war, and that once he'd settled down with a family, the better angels of his nature blossomed. Unfortunately, this was not the case. The fact is that there are some men who are so helplessly addicted to cruelty that nothing else ever makes them feel quite so alive. They'll inflict their hatefulness on whoever's at hand, and more often than not, that means their families. Such was the lot of Ralph's wife and children. Having been gifted to him like chattel, his wife had often borne the brunt of his savagery, but each child took their share. The boys had an early and lucky escape. Being the sons of a decorated knight, they were sent to begin their martial training as pages at the age of seven or eight, but the girls... the girls had to stay and find some way to survive. However, they did at least have each other. Ralph only had two daughters. They were born years apart, but they looked so similar and were bonded so closely that they were often mistaken as mother and daughter by visitors to the manor house. Both were slim and fair, with delicate features and slight builds. But what really distinguished them, despite their disparate ages, was their choice of dress. For the elder daughter Eleanor would wear nothing but blue, while the younger dressed in nothing but the starkest white. Despite their father's temperament, they each made it their business to bring joy to the other, and for a long while they were happy, so long as their father stayed away. However, this was all to change when it came time for Eleanor to marry. Although news of Eleanor's beauty had spread far and wide, so had word of her father's temperament, and as a result no house of standing would consent to join their family to his. Years went by and yet every match Ralph proposed was rejected and with every rejection his rage grew until it was a roiling black chasm of hate. Eventually, in a fit of utter depravity, Ralph declared that if he could not make Eleanor another man's wife, he would use her as a wife for himself. I shall spare you the details of his nightly assaults as there are some things too horrific even for a ghost story. But suffice it to say that after months of his perversion, Eleanor's belly began to swell. Upon seeing this, Ralph chose to compound his sins and confirm his place in hell. Terrified of the pregnancy being discovered and his lechery exposed, he confined Eleanor to this dungeon until the child was born. There, upon hearing his first cries, Rolf snatched his son from Eleanor's breast and throttled him right there in front of her. Eleanor's screams of anguish could be heard for miles that day. Such was the heart-wrenching agony of her despair that some believed they were the wails of the damned forcing their way up from hell. When her father finally released her from the dungeon, she couldn't eat or drink, she wouldn't bathe nor arise from her bed. Her anguish had hollowed her out, turned her into a shadow of a person. That was until Margaret brought her back. Little by little, with love and patience, spoonfuls of broth, and her strange little peaceful smile. As she recovered, Rolf stayed away. He no longer had any interest in the emaciated, unwashed skeleton he had reduced his daughter to. Men like him, though. Men like him are never quiet for long. Inflicting pain is the only power they know, and they could no more give it up than stop themselves breathing. So, 
Slowly but surely, he began to settle his attentions on Margaret. Seeing the signs of her father's shifting interest, Eleanor took action to protect her sister. Each night she would take Margaret and hide her somewhere new, somewhere her father would never find her. Then she would take the strongest wine she could find from the cellar and serve it to him with dinner. When he began to slur his words, she began to bait him. She would insult and rile him and keep at him until his temper broke. Then she would lead him on a merry chase down every corridor, up every staircase and through every outbuilding until sooner or later he would tire or stumble and then collapse into a puddle of his own drunkenness. One night though, he had no thirst. He wouldn't drink, even when offered the finest wines from the cellar, and the only thing affecting his voice was rage. Seeing the danger that he posed, Eleanor took Margaret to the dungeon and locked her in the smallest cell, hoping that the strong locks and iron bars would protect her. Then she returned to her father's table, and just as before, she began to insult and rile him, and just as before, his temper flared, but tonight he was fast and feral. Still, she managed to escape and in desperation ran to the top of the tower. She did her best to dodge his blows as he snatched at her, to slip from his grasp as he swung for her, and to tear at his flesh with her nails and her teeth. She fought as hard as she could for as long as she could. But he was a knight, and she was not. And before long her valiant efforts were overpowered. Realising this tyrant would never desist in his hideous torment, she summoned the last remaining ounce of her strength and pushed as hard as she could against the tower. Closer and closer to the edge she pushed, using every ounce of grit and determination she could muster before. Finally they tumbled over the edge and fell into the darkness below. I wish I could tell you that his body broke her fall. But unfortunately this story has no happy ending. They fell and the impact killed them both instantly. However, at least Eleanor's death was mercifully quick. Margaret on the other hand was much less fortunate. Entombed in that dungeon with no one to free her and no chance of breaking through the locks or the bars, Margaret eventually wasted away from hunger and thirst, all alone, with no one to comfort or mourn her. That isn't the end of their story though. Years later, after a castle had been built where the manor house stood, those who lived there and those who visited would often talk of a blue lady and a white lady who haunted the grounds. Even today many visitors report catching sight of the sisters. In fact, a good friend of mine has told me of a trip she took to the castle with her sons. Excited as they were to explore the castle, she let them run ahead, and before long they returned, telling her to come and see a lady dressed strangely, standing in the corner of one of the lower rooms. Assuming that the lady was part of some living history display, my friend thought nothing of it when they returned to find her vanished. But upon mentioning this to the museum staff, they were told no such actors were on site that day. Strangely enough, the one thing her boys remembered above all else was the lady's strangely peaceful smile. Unfortunately though, this is not a piece her sister shares. While Margaret is content to greet visitors with a smile and a wave, Eleanor is very different. Her spirit spends its time mourning for a dead child and leading visitors on a merry chase around the grounds. You see, to her, all of us look like her father. So if you see her and she starts to beckon you, it's best to walk away. Those who follow her tend to lose their way and sometimes even their footing near a steep ledge. So if you do see her, don't follow her, but do give her a smile and a wave. If anyone's soul deserves a little kindness, it's hers. <laughs>